And I think we'll begin. Um, I'd like to start by thanking everybody for joining us for another OpenEye webinar. My name is Matt Ball. I'm an application scientist at OpenEye, and I'll be sort of running the back end of the webinar here. Our goal is to stick to about uh, 45 to 50 minutes for the presentation. Feel free to ask questions in chat at any point during the presentation, and I will collect them, and Greg uh, will go through some of them at the end, but because we want to stick to time, we may answer questions individually by email for those that we don't get to. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Greg Warren. He's a senior application scientist here at OpenEye. He's been with the company for about seven years. Previously, he was at GSK, so I'll turn it over to Greg. All right. Thank you for joining us. Um, what we're going to cover this morning is how OpenEye approaches the docking problem. But before I do that, I wanted to do, if you will, sort of a review, maybe a philosophical um, starting or statement uh, about docking. So one of the questions that you can ask is, why do people do docking? And if you go through and look at the literature, if you talk to people, there are really three reasons why people use docking as a way of doing drug discovery or whatever their or um, lead discovery, uh, whatever they whatever the task is that they're doing in terms of structure-based drug design. So one of the the first thing that we uh, the people have talked about is binding affinity prediction, and then there's also pose prediction and virtual screening that are done by docking programs. Now, I don't know how many of you remember this, but the first docking paper. Uh, and, uh, or at least the first docking, published docking method happened in 1982. It was the program DOC that came out of Tat Kuntz's lab, and it was Jeff Blaney that was the lead author on that. So docking as a method or as a way of doing things is 31 years old. And while we don't really know, though we could ask, why docking was invented, most likely the reason was to do affinity prediction. Let's pose a ligand, and then let's use some sort of method to predict how active that ligand is. And one of the questions that we can ask 31 years later is, are docking programs um, capable of predicting affinity? And the quick answer to that is no. And I show that by data right here. There's many, many publications that show this same sort of behavior. So this is a publication from 2008 by Istvan Ivnyeni. And it, you can see that there's no correlation between the docking score and the measured affinity for these compounds. Now, there are a number of theoretical reasons why binding affinity shouldn't be predicted by docking programs, and here is one of them uh, shown here, and that is entropy. So I'm showing you on, on the x-axis there is um, delta G, measured delta G for these compounds, and on the y-axis we have measured delta H using ITC. You can see here that there's no correlation across a very large number of targets between the delta G that's measured and the delta H. That means that entropy has a large component in, what, on the, on, in the free energy of binding for these compounds. Now, unfortunately, docking programs do not do a good job of estimating entropy, and be, mar, largely because we look at a single pose. We don't look at a collection of poses. And that's one of the theoretical reasons why we wouldn't expect docking programs to be able to predict affinity correctly. So I am not going to talk in this presentation about binding affinity prediction. And as I said in a talk recently, I, I would hope that the field as a whole would stop trying to do binding affinity prediction using docking programs because it just will not be successful. And it doesn't make the field actually look good um, at all. So what we're going to talk to about today is post-prediction and virtual screening. We'll start, first of all, with post-prediction. And now we're going to use uh, OpenEye's docking suite to talk about how well um, OpenEye's docking tools do post-prediction. Now, when one year, one's doing post-prediction or docking by any means, you have to have a certain amount of structural information. And for any docking exercise, you must have a protein structure. That's the minimal requirement. Now, the minimum for that minimal requirement, if you will, is an APO structure. So do we have a structure of the protein without a ligand bound? Many times in pharmaceutical research, 
Either the company itself generates a complex structure, or there may be, depending on what target you're working on, a complex structure available in the public domain. So you can also use complex information, and that is a little bit more information rich. If you happen to be very lucky, you might have more than one complex. So let's say you're working on a number of kinase structures. There are many different complex structures that are published in the public domain, or you might have those available in-house uh, from, your, from your crystallographers. What is that information? It's important to note that the experimental measure of induced fit is complex structures. So if you have more than one complex structure, you can see how the protein conforms to optimize its interaction with a particular ligand. And we're going to talk about this later on, about how complex information is experimental induced fit and how we might use that information. So at OpenEye, we have pose prediction, and I'm generating a graph here. On the left, you can see this is virtual screening for, po for docking programs and pose prediction for docking programs. And then on the y-axis, we have structure-based methods, so methods that use structure only, and methods that use ligand information along with structure. So the three applications that OpenEye have, has is FRED, which is designed to be a virtual screening tool and uses only structural information. We have hybrid, which we're going to talk about today, which is, again, designed to be a virtual screening tool and a post-prediction tool, and it uses some ligand information and some structural information. And posit, which is designed to be a post-prediction tool, which relies on ligand information more than it relies on structural information. And let's see how each one of these programs as we look at them, will behave relative to the pose prediction problem. So I'm using FRED and hybrid in ways it wasn't necessarily designed to be used, but let's see how well it does for this particular problem. So the data set that we're going to look at today for protein-only information is the iridium data set, and I've shown you an, a, um, a reference for that. It's a data set that we published at OpenEye in 2012, and there's the reference. So how well does FRED do against the Iridium data set in terms of pose prediction? Well, if we take the standard metric in the blue right here, which is how well does a structure, how well does the top rank structure by the scoring function reproduce the binding mode at two angstroms or better, you can see that 64% of the time FRED's top ranked pose by the scoring function is within two angstroms of the crystal structure. So a 64% success rate. And I show you other metrics here. If we take the top 20 poses, um, our success rate is about 85%. All right, so that's how well we can do using only the protein information alone. What happens if we add in ligand information? And in particular, if we add in ligand information, to select the poses that we're going to score. Let me show you a, a model of the difference between FRED docking and hybrid docking. So at the very start, for both of these programs, we generate an exhaustive set of poses, and we discard all those poses that clash with the protein. At the bottom down here, we score a set of poses using the protein-only scoring function. So both of these programs use exactly the same start, and exactly the same finish. What do they do in between? And here's uh, showing you what they do in between. For Fred, we take the exhaustive set of poses and we score each one of that set versus the protein scoring function. And we select the best top 100 that we pass on doing some rigid optimization and then rescore versus the protein. So the protein score selects from the exhaustive set and then we rescore an optimized subset from that. How is hybrid different? Hybrid's different in how it selects the poses in the intermediate step. So what we do here is we take the exhaustive pose set. We select those pose base poses from the exhaustive set based on how we know the ligand binds already. So we use a ligand score to say if the ligand, if the exhaustive pose is not close to where the known ligand binds, we will ignore it. So we've focused essentially the scoring set down from anything that's in the active site to only a set that binds close to where the ligand is. And then we rescore those, again, using the protein score. 
So how does the selection of the poses to reproduce what we know improve the performance? It improves it enormously. So we go from 64% for the top rank pose to 92% for the top rank pose when we use hybrid. A very, very large difference. Okay. Now what happens if we say, you know what, the most information rich or the most reliable data is actually present in the complex structure. Can we use that information in addition to the protein information with a new program called POSIT? And like I said, we are prioritizing the ligand information over the protein information. Now how is that done diagrammatically? So I'm going to compare POSIT with hybrid here. At the very start, we use an exhaustive set of poses in both cases. But in the case of hybrid, it's an exhaustive set of poses for the whole binding site. In the case of posit, it's an exhaustive set of poses where the ligand, the known ligand binds. So we don't populate the whole binding site in posit like we do with hybrid. The second step is we now select the poses based on ligand binding. So in terms of hybrid and posit, same sort of select intermediate selection. But there's a very diff big difference at the end. So for hybrid, remember, we score versus the protein. For posit, we score versus the ligand after doing an all-atom optimization. Okay, So a very big difference. Posit follows the ligand information all, way, all the way through the process, whereas hybrid starts out with the protein information, selects by ligand, and then rescores by the protein. And what happens when we use this ligand prioritize method? Well, in the case of posit, we get 100% of the poses within two angstroms, the top rank poses within two angstroms. Now, it probably seems a little bit ridiculous that I'm showing you this because this is a self-docking experiment using the ligand information. But the truth is that any docking program that is doing the things correctly should be getting, for a self-docking experiment, 100% correct. What this is telling us over here for FRED or any other docking program that uses protein information is that we are not using that information correctly and we are not getting the right answers. The correct answer here is 100%. POSIT is doing what we would expect all docking programs should do for pose prediction. Unfortunately, all the other docking programs, including FRED and Hybrid, do not do what they're supposed to do for this simple ex experiment, which is cognate docking or self-docking. Now before I talk about next thing, I want to talk about how you actually would test to see whether or not your docking program is better. And I've not shown you the data, but we've, we have another presentation and, and we're working on a publication on how to test whether or not our program is actually getting better. So I'm showing you a statement at the top here that says on average FRED 3.0 is better than FRED 2.2. And I'm showing you the data that we have for this. So here's the mean RMSD values for FRED 2.2, the mean RMSD value for FRED 3.0, and the mean RMSD value for hybrid. And you'll notice that in each case, this is decreasing. And I'm showing you standard deviation. But what I'd like to point out is that if I do a statistical test to say, is FRED 3 better than FRED 2, and I find that it's statistically significant, the p-value in the in this case, or the alpha value is less than 0.05, that doesn't necessarily mean that if I have statistical significance, that actually helps you or me do my work in an everyday sense. So the test that we did in this case was a paired t-test, and we're also looking at the Cohen effect size, and here's a reference for it because I don't have time uh, to talk about that in this presentation. And what we find when we do this analysis is that FRED 3.0 is better, statistically significantly better than FRED 2.2 on the paired t-test, but that difference is of no practical value. So if we estimate what that really means in terms of RMS difference between these two um, populations or distributions, the difference really is zero angstroms in a practical sense. So while FRED 3.0 is better than FRED 3.2, it isn't practically important in terms of your ability to predict the pose. Now what would happen if we looked at the difference between a hybrid and FRED? Again, we're going to use the same thing, a pair of t-tests. We're going to look at the 
Cohen effect size. And in this case, when we do that, we find that hybrid is statistically significantly better than Fred. And that when, and when we look at the actual coordinate error difference, this value is 0.85. And that is something that's useful. Okay? We're telling you that when you use hybrid to predict the poses versus Fred 3, you are going to, on average, get 9 tenths of an angstrom better or 8 tenths of an angstrom better at term, in terms of being able to predict the pose correctly. And that is something that is very, very useful. So using statistics to be able to tell you yourself whether or not an improvement in the performance in the program is actually statistically significant and whether or not it's practically important. And the statistical term for practical importance, which we've shown down here, is substantive uh, significance. Now, let's go to the actual experiment that you care about if you're using a docking program, and that is cross-docking. It's of no interest to take a complex structure, which you know the answer for, and dock the program back in, the ligand back in. What you want to do is to take a structure and dock new ligands in and predict the pose correctly. Now, there was a paper that came out in uh, 2010 that showed a very, very interesting correlation given a cross-docking experiment. Okay? And they showed that if the shape of the ligand being docked was similar to the shape of the ligand in the complex, their pose prediction was more accurate. I'm going to show you the data in the very next slide that came out of that publication. But it's an interesting thing to think about. If the shape of the ligand is similar to the shape in the complex, then why am I getting better pose prediction? Well, one of the reasons is induced fit, right? I have an experimental structure that is done its induced fit to fit that shape and the electrostatics of that ligand. So if I replace that ligand, I already have a structure that's induced to recognize my new ligand because the shape of the protein and the electrostatics of the protein are rearranged to be complementary to that particular ligand shape. Now let me show you the data that came. Oh, before I do that, let me talk about the metric that they used to measure ligand similarity. And the metric they used was Tanamoto combo. So Tanamoto combo includes a shape Tanamoto, and I've shown that in the outline of the molecule here, where we compare the shape of a query molecule to the shape of a database molecule. So we compare the shape of the ligand in the, stru in the complex structure to the ligand that we're trying to dock, and we measure that shape similarity. It's a Tanamoto metric, so the range goes from 0 to 1. The other component that we have is a color Tanamoto. So I've shown you here spherical representations of particular types of chemistry. So we have rings, donors, acceptors, cations. We compare the, the chemistry of the molecule in the, in the complex structure to the chemistry of the molecule that we're trying to dock. If those are similar, we give it a value of 1. Again, it's a Tanamoto, so the range goes from 0 to 1. So the total Tanamoto combo goes from 0 to 2 because we sum the shape Tanamoto and the color Tanamoto. And here is the data that I had talked about. So on the x-axis, we have the similarity between the ligand that I'm docking to the similarity uh, to the ligand in the x-ray structure. So it goes from 0 to 2. And we have on the y-axis the percent of success. So how many times is the top-ranked pose within two angstroms of the crystal structure? And I'm showing you four different docking programs. So let's look in green here. You can see when the similarity between the ligand in the crystal structure and the ligand I'm docking is low, my pose prediction performance is very, very poor. And as the similarity increases, my pose prediction increases. That's a very, very interesting idea and a very, possibly a very useful idea. So what happens if we take this sort of metric and we apply hybrid and posit to it? How well do hybrid and posit do in terms of cross-docking. And I'm showing you, first of all, the hybrid results. So you can see, again, for hybrid, 
poor performance when there's very dissimilar ligands, probably has a different binding mode, so that ligand isn't, isn't the protein isn't first arranged around the ligand correctly, and the ligand actually might by binding differently. But as the ligand similarity increases, we see a very, very large increase in the performance of hybrid. And you can see here at about 0.9, hybrid is better than any of the other docking programs that were measured for this data set. And hybrid keeps getting better and better and better as the, as the similarity increases. How well does POSIT do? Well, POSIT does the same thing. Now, you'll notice here where the ligands are very dissimilar, POSIT actually performs worse than docking programs. But as we go past one, it gets much better in terms of its post prediction capabilities than hybrid or any of the other docking programs. Let me put two metrics in here. So a Tanamoto combo of one, you can see the success rate is about 65%, 64%. At a Tanamoto combo of 1.4, the success rate here on this data set is about 86, 87%. Okay? Now, that's retrospective data. It would be really nice if I could show you how well POSIT does on prospective data, and it turns out we have been very, very fortunate at OpenEye in that Abbott Labs, or AVV uh, now, um, which uh, were, who were part of co-developing POSIT, used this program heavily, and they used it prospectively in the sense that we... They made a prediction about the, what the binding mode should be for a compound, and then later on, that compound was complex with the protein and a crystal structure was solved. So we make a prospective prediction, and that was tested experimentally. And let me show you the results for that. So here I'm showing you again similarity to the X-ray ligand that was used to make the prediction, and here is the percent success rate relative to the actual ligand structure. So you can see where the similarity is poor, it's poor, it's poorer in terms of its percentage, and as the similarity of the ligand increases, the performance increases. Let me put those same lines off. So remember from the retrospective data, we had about a 65% success rate. Here in the prospective data, it's about 58% at Tanamoto Combo 1. Remember at 1.4, we had about an 87% success rate. Here we have about a 79% success rate for the prospective data. But that is still very, very robust in terms of using the retrospective data to see whether or not prospective data is actually predicted accurately. Let me show you the actual numbers. So there were 29 complex, there were more than 29 complex structures done here, but there were 29 complex structures with had a Tanamoto combo greater than 1.4. 23 of those had a um, had a pose prediction that was less than two angstroms from the crystal structure. That's a 79% success rate. If we do the same sort of cutoff in the docking results that I showed you in the previous slide, we would, success, we would excess, expect about a 64% success rate for the de best docking program um, at the same Tanamoto combo. So a very large improvement, 64 to 79% in terms of ability to predict poses correctly. Now, um, one of the things that we've been asked is, well, you're using Tanamoto Combo of 1 or Tanamoto Combo of 1.4. How, you know, that's lead optimization. How useful is that in terms of my day-to-day -day work of predicting poses? And we can come back to that from Abbott data. So here we're looking at automated results that came from 2000 to 2009. And what I would like to show you is that for... 55% of the structures that were submitted for post predictions, the Tanamoto combo between the compound being submitted for post prediction and the compounds that were in their database was greater than one. So 55% of the time, at least for the Abbott folks generating compounds, this program is effective and useful for what they want to use it for. All right, so let's summarize a little bit about how POSIT works. And this is where we come back to the title of the talk, which is OE docking, is it possible to know when it works? So POSIT is very, very different from any other pose prediction uh, program in that it does not return bad poses. If we have a prediction 
that our pose reproduction rate will be low, what the probability of success will be low, we do not return a pose. If the tanamono combo between the ligand in your complex and the ligand you're trying to dock is less than one, we do not return a pose. So we do not give you bad answers. That's if the important first point. The second point is that we have a better scoring function. Now, what do I mean by scoring function? The scoring function in posit is actually a probability of success. So taking the data that we've showed you previously, we can calculate a probability of success from the retrospective data versus Tanamoto combo, and we can predict what the success rate is. So the way posit scores is you have a 30% success a prediction of a 30% success rate at getting this pose within two angstroms of the experimental, or you have an 80% success rate. And that's a number that's useful. The numbers that come out of docking programs, let's say they're minus 10 or minus 50 or minus 123, don't mean anything to you. I don't know what a, a docking score of minus 200 means or minus 3. In terms of being able to say that is a good pose prediction, or bad post prediction. Posit tells you what the probability of success will be. How do we do that? It turns out the Tanamoto combo is an excellent predictor. Again, it has to do with induced fit, and we can use Tanamoto combo to build a probability function that allows us to tell when Posit will be successful and when we think it will not be successful to not return a pose. Okay, so let's summarize the first part of this. Um, presentation in terms of pose prediction. How can we do, how can we use open eyes tools to predict poses? Well, first of all, when ligands are dissimilar, I've already shown you the data, hybrid and, and posit don't work as well because they're biased towards a particular pose. The standard functions, FRED in particular, where it doesn't have any ligand information, perform the best. Now they perform poorly, but they perform the best. So when you have very dissimilar ligands, uh, very dissimilar ligands in terms of your protein structure or you have an APO structure, you will get pose predictions, but it won't be necessarily high probabil probability of success. In the intermediate range, where there is intermediate similarity between a complex structure and the ligand that you're docking, hybrid works best, so you can select to use that program. And where you have similar ligands in shape. Now, it's important to remember when I say similar, I'm not talking graph similar. I'm talking similarity in shape. Then posit works best. So we have a program, essentially, that's designed, an application that's designed to give you the best answer depending on the type of data that you have available. And you can select, again, depending on the type of data that you have available. All right? So that's post prediction in the open eye docking suite. Let's talk a little bit now about virtual screening performance. And for this, I'm going to talk about two data sets. So I'm going to show you virtual screening performance against two data sets. The first one on the left is the DUD data set uh, published by the Shoiket group. And here's the reference. So it's 40 targets. It has a set of active molecules, which contain many analogs. It has a set of decoys that were selected, presumed decoys. These are not experimental decoys. These are presumed decoys. And it has a set of proteins that are selected and supplied by the, gen by the person who generated, people that generated the data set. Now, because this data set contains many analogs, Andy Good and Tudor Oprea generated a new data set, which we're calling DUD Wombat. This is a subset of DUD. 11 of the targets are direct matches for uh, DUD. There are two other targets that were not part of DUD. It contains an active set of molecules by, in which they have deliberately and very actively made sure that there's not analog information present. So all of the actives in this case are not analogs of other actives in the data set. They use the same set of decoys and the same set of proteins. And let's look to see how well open eyes uh, tools work for this virtual screening data set. So I'm showing you on the left the performance of hybrid, FRED, and a 2D metric. We're using max keys here for virtual screening performance against the DUD data. And the fact that this two-dimensional method performs so well is a clear indication that this data set contains a very large number of analog compounds. 
So unfortunately for this data set, I can't really say that my three-dimensional method, which is more expensive, is actually in, in a statistically significant improvement. Yes, FRED is better numerically. Yes, hybrid is better than FRED numerically. But I can't really say that these methods are better than doing a very, very fast 2D method. Now, if I look at the information at the data set which contains no analog information, now the 2D methods perform worse than random or very close to random, but the 3D methods actually have true signal. So here for Fred and Hybrid, uh, we have true signal, and you'll notice that there's no difference between Fred and Hybrid. Why is that? Well, Hybrid works when you have, again, ligands that are similar, but we've removed all analog information. So we would expect that hybrid would perform as well as FRED, and we are very encouraged that FRED hybrid is performing numerically the equivalent to FRED in this data set. So that's great results, right? We have true signal present in our 3D methods, and FRED and hybrid are behaving exactly the way we would expect them to. Okay? Now, that is a data set which, again, is a toy problem, right? The suppliers of the data set have told me which structure I have to use. It may not be the best structure, but they've told me which structure I have to use, and that's the one that I use for this data set. But in your case, when you're doing virtual screening, you may have several protein structures available to you. And how do you choose which is the best protein structure that's going to give you the best virtual screening performance? Well, in the past, the way we've dealt with this problem is to do ensemble docking, so essentially do an average problem, right? I don't know which is the best structure, so I'll choose four or I'll choose five, and I'll dock all of those, I'll combine the results, and I'll get a result. And that's great, and it works better on average, but here's a slight problem with doing ensemble docking, which is shown in a number of publications. And here is the data to let me point out. So right here, this gray bar is the best performance by a single receptor. So if I know what the best single receptor is, this best single receptor outperforms any of the ensemble methods significantly. But of course, you can say to me, well, but I don't know what the best single receptor is, so that's why I do ensemble docking. The intriguing idea here is, let's build a hypothesis. What if as in for, for post-prediction, virtual screening performance would, prefer, would improve if I had a receptor that was induced fit to recognize that ligand. So can we use this Tanamoto combo correlation for virtual screening as well as for post-prediction? And of course, because I pose this question, the answer is yes. So I compare the shape of the ligand that I'm docking to a set of complex structures, my post prediction is more accurate. Can I do exactly the same thing for virtual screening? And here is the data. So looking at the DUD data set over here, on the left, you can see here again is my 2D method. Here's FRED, here is hybrid, and here is the performance when I take an, a random selection of 10 receptors out of the PDB for each of these 40 targets. And I then look at that receptor and say, which is the receptor that has a ligand most similar to the molecule that I'm docking? And that's the receptor I use. You can see here, there's a pretty significant increase numerically in the virtual screening performance against this data set. What happens for the MDUD data set, uh, for the Wombat data set, where we've removed the analog information? Well, again, you can see here, there is essentially equivalent performance between FRED and hybrid, and there's a small increase in performance when we use the multiple receptor method here for hybrid. Now, the small increase in performance, which is not statistically significant, is probably related to, or at least the, the inability to determine sig statistical significance, is related to this is 11 structures, this is 40. So we've got a smaller sample size we would expect no more numerical uh, instability between that. What I'd like to point out for the, for the DUD data set is this fact right here. If I look at the confidence interval that I can calculate for this data set, you can see that going from a single receptor 
to multiple receptors decreases the variability in my sample. And that is incredibly important because what you would like is the ability to say, I am using a method and I know that the variability across targets is very low. I know that on average, I am going to get an AUC value of 0.7 or 0.8 or 0.81, and that across many different targets, I am not going to see a large variability. Again, this comes back to the idea of knowing when I'm going to have the correct answer. Is it possible to know when I have the correct answer? Yes, because I've removed, the, decreased the variability across targets. The last thing that I want to talk about is a publication that came out in JCAM, the summer of JCAM, in the summer last year in JCAMD, which was part of a docking symposium that Nisa Nivens and I uh, organized at the ACS in uh, the spring of 2011. What I'm showing you is the docking results against the DUD data set, and I'm showing you median AUC values across all 40 targets for 13 different programs, which were the people that participated in this um, docking symposium. So you can see there's a large amount of variability. Remember that random performance for AUC is 0.5. You can see there's a large amount of variability across the 13 targets. And note here that hybrid is number 12. I've deliberately not told you what the docking programs are. This was an agreement that we had with the participants that we would not reveal. But I happen to know, because I was involved in generating the data, that this is the performance of hybrid. It's not the best. In fact, it's the third best. This program number seven and program number 11 are better in terms of the median AUC performance on the DUD data set. Now, one of the things that we did in this symposium, which was a little bit different than most than has been done to date, was actually to try and build a null hypothesis. So how much of the information that's being derived from the scoring function comes truly from the three-dimensional structure? So the null hypothesis here is that for each of the 40 targets, we ask the participants to dock against a wrong receptor. So dock against the correct receptor and dock against a protein that was chosen that is not the correct receptor. Pretend that the scores coming out of there are for the correct and then score them. So note again, here is the value for the random performance. And if you have signal above random, this means that your scoring function is saying a molecule is active when it's docked into the wrong protein, right? It should be random. If it's the wrong protein, an active molecule shouldn't be getting a good score versus a decoys. Now let me point out that three of the participants didn't do this experiment, so participant one, four, and ten did not, so there are no values here for those three values. And what we can do to say what is the true signal uh, for docking programs is to take our previous slide, the results from the previous slide, and to subtract these null data points from them, and this will give us a measure of what the true performance is for this three-dimensional method. So remember, 1, 4, and, and, and 10 did not return results. Those are blank. And if we look at this difference, you can see here hybrid is now one of the highest performing, if not the highest performing, in terms of its ability to take the protein information and to use it correctly, to not be confused by a wrong protein. So to use the correct protein information to select the true active molecules. So let's summarize virtual screening performance. Ligand information improves performance. We've shown that in, with data from hybrid. Using multiple structures so that we can select the correct induced fit structure improves performance. We've shown that again with the, the DUD data set. And I'd like to point out that FRED is very, very fast at doing virtual screening. If we use FRED itself, it's about three seconds per molecule. If we do hybrid, because we now select a subset of the poses to look at, it actually doubles the speed on uh, and the median speed from three seconds down to one and a half. And here is the thing that has me extremely excited. I don't have to do ensemble docking anymore and increase my docking times by a factor of four or five. 
by using this multiple receptor, I have a very, very small increase in the median time that it takes, yet I get better results. So multiple receptor hybrid has solved, if you will, the ensemble docking program at no cost and speed whatsoever. I'd like to talk a little bit about how FRED has been used in the, in the um, literature. So there are more than 90, 39 publications where an open-eye docking application has been used. A good chunk of about a third of those are evaluations. And I've shown you the results from those. FRED performs as well as any other docking program. Posit and hybrid are better at pose predictions than any other docking program. Virtual screening, uh, Fred, Fed, Fred performs very, very well. Hybrid is better. Again, we showed that for the evaluation data set. And both have been used in the literature to find prospective hits. Another application for open eyes docking program, which is very different than other docking programs available to you, is that people use open eyes Fred in particular to generate poses for other methods. Because we have a very unique search algorithm, it's an exhaustive systematic search. Many other scoring functions or many people are using the FRED pose generation algorithm as a way of generating a set of poses and then moving on to score those in other methods. Now, I've talked about OE docking in its present form. So we have an open eye docking toolkit, which I've not talked about. We have FRED hybrid and posit as applications. And if I had the ability to look in the future, if I had a flux capacitor like in the 1980s movie Back to the Future, I could try to predict whether or not docking is going to be solved in the, the binding affinity prediction problem is going to be solved in the future or whether or not docking is going to get better. I don't know that, but I can tell you how open I is going to try and, and make improvements in docking in the future. So in the future, we will still have FRED hybrid posit in the docking toolkit. But we're going to add some other things that we think may be important to solve indi individual or particular problems in docking. So P450 may be scoring function, a scoring function that's more physics related, maybe a scoring function that you're allowed to customize based on the information that you have available. And we possibly are even considering using dynamics in the future. Let me summarize very briefly. Open eyes docking tools inside the OE docking suite are fast. They use all the information available. So we have applications that use protein, ligand, and multiple structures. And what I think is most important about the docking, uh, the OE docking suite, and where we are going in the future, is to divide and develop methods by which we will know we can predict when the programs are going to work and when the programs are not going to work. And thank you very much for your time and attention. Okay, thank you very much, Greg, for the presentation. There's a few questions, and we have time maybe just for one or two of them. Um, so there was a question about uh, how we deal with conformers. So when we're computing the similarity of a ligand we want to dock to an x-ray ligand. Um, do we generate conformers? How do we do that? What algorithms do we use? Yes, so um, the what we do is we look at the conformation database and we ask is there any conf what is there any conformer in that conformation database that matches the conformation in the x-ray and what is the best match? So let me put that in more clean terms. I look at my confirmation database. I see for each confirmation, I measure a Tanimoto combo. I find one that has confirmation that has a Tanimoto combo of 1.6 and all the way down. Maybe there's some confirmations that have Tanimoto combos of 0.2. I take that 1.6 confirmation and I now use it to compare with the other crystal structures as well. So if all the other crystal structures in my system uh, if we're doing multiple receptor, if all the other crystal structures in my system do not have a confirmation that is better than 1.6, then I use that particular uh, receptor as the one. So yeah, great question. Um, we search through the whole confirmation data phase, find the best match, and then use that as the marker to compare with everything else.
Okay, thank you. Um, there were also uh, one or two questions about um, the slide where we're comparing um, the Tanimoto combo to the closing success rate. Um, so when we, you talk about a success rate of say 58%, does that mean that uh, all of those ligands bind and we're successfully predicting the pose of 58% of them, or is that addressing how many of those ligands actually bind, bind or don't bind? Ah, that's, that's another really good question that I didn't explain properly. This is a cross-stocking data set, so we have crystal structures for all of these ligands. So that's how we know whether or not the binding mode is correct. So we align all these crystal structures and now we take the receptor and we dock in the other ligand and we can compare its pose to its known crystal structure. So that's how we know whether all of these ligands are active. We know all of these ligands bind because there's a crystal structure. So this is a this is a very specific data set and I put the reference in there one data set, the one that I showed today, was a kinase data set, but we've done the same analysis for a data set that is a broad data set. It was published by Lilly in uh, 2000 or 2002. Okay, thank you. Um, so one more question about that uh, graph. It seemed that for many of the methods, the success rate actually decreased in the highest region of Tanimoto combo similarity. Uh, do you have any hypothesis or explanation of why that might be happening? We have a couple hypotheses, and I think that probably the best explanation is that the number of structures where there is a, and, and the bin that you're looking at is a 1.8 to 2. So um, the number of structures in that bin compared to all of the others is much, much lower. And what we think is the problem is there are two possible problems. One, it's a numerical instability because there is a much smaller sample size, so you're going to see random fluctuations. The second one is that this is probably a measure of uh, omega missing a confirmation, so omega not necessarily getting a confirmation correct, or maybe even the other docking program. So it's a very small subtlety in very similar things where you're not reproducing confirmation. Now it's difficult for me to say that is really, really true for the other docking programs. So that's why we think the best explanation for this dip in all cases between uh, 1.6 to 1.8, 1.8 to 2 is actually a very, very sample, small sample size problem. So we have tens to hundreds of examples in all the other bins. This is the case where we have a few to tens of uh, structures in that case. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we're going to close the, the question period. For those questions that we didn't get to, uh, we will answer them uh, by email. And we'll also be posting the uh, slides as a PDF as well as a video of this presentation on our website. So if you want to look at the slides again or watch the presentation again, you'll be able to find it there. So thank you very much to Greg and thank you to all of you for attending. Bye.